Tämän aamupäivän toinen paneeli vie meidät rakentavaan teemaan, eli kestävään kaupunkikehitykseen. Ja this panel will be in English. Tämä paneeli on englannin kielellä. Ensin jutellaan kuitenkin studion maestron kanssa muutama sana. First the interview with Markus Laine. Markus Laine, hyvää aamupäivää. Hyvää aamupäivää. Ja tervetuloa johtajuussymposiumiin. Tässä on lähtemässä käyntiin kestävä kaupunkikehitys aiheella englannin kielellä. Paneeli, onko kielen kannat viritelty? Kyllä tuossa äsken viriteltiin paneelin kanssa. <laughs> Hyvä. Ähm, ensin pientä johdatusta aiheeseen. Kerrottakoon, että olet väitellyt aiheesta ympäristökysymys ja aseveli Akseli. Ympäristön politisoituminen Tampereella vuosina 1959 ja siitä vuoteen 1995. Äh, et tykkää ihan pienistä aiheista tarttua. Joo, se oli aika hauska aika niin kuin ylipäänsä suomalaiskaupunkin kehityksessä ja silloinhan nuo ympäristökysymykset sanotaan 70-luvun alusta lähtien rupesi nouseen keskusteluun ja ö, erilaiset kansalaisryhmät nosti niitä oikeastaan ja sitten poliittinen eliitti reagoi niihin pienellä viiveellä. Jos puhutaan poliittisista ryhmistä, niin joku siellä on yhteinen sävel löytynyt näissä ympäristöasioissa? No tota, kyllä mä niin kuin ajattelisin sille, että niin kuin kaikki tunnustaa kestävän kaupunkikehityksen tärkeyden, mutta sitten tota, Ehkä lähinnä keskustellaan siitä, että mikä on ambitiotaso. Ja tota, kyllä mä sanoisin, että niin kuin Suomella on tosi hyvät mahdollisuudet nyt olla ihan niin kuin maailman luokkaa tässä kestävässä kehityksessä. Mutta niin kuin Kurra Lindströmin sanoi, niin meidän pitäisi tehdä vielä vähän paremmin, niin se onnistuisi. Meillä on kaikki edellytykset siihen. Ja on, on tota, niin kuin hienoja projekteja, missä sitä yritetään, vaikka niin kuin Hiedanranta Tampereella. Kestävän kaupunkikehityksen taustalla on muun muassa YK on vuonna 2016 hyväksymä maailmanlaajuinen kaupunkikehitysohjelma, YK on kestävän kehityksen tavoitteet ja EUn oma kaupunkiagenda. Kohta pääsette keskustelemaan tästä kansainvälisesti merkittävästä aiheesta tarkemmin, mutta pystyykö nykyinen poliittinen järjestelmä eri puolilla maailmaa vastaamaan tavoitteisiin? Onko se mahdollista? Kyllä mä uskon, että se on mahdollista. Se on haastavaa, mutta se on mahdollista. Ja tota, koronakriisi on osoittanut, että aika isoihinkin muutoksiin pystytään lyhyellä aikavälillä. Mutta tota, jotta se tapahtuisi, niin tarvitaan hyviä esimerkkejä. Ja tässä taas Suomella olisi hyvä, hieno mahdollisuus antaa niitä. Studiossa on nyt mukana alan huippuosaajia, joten ei muuta kuin väittelemään ja keskustelemaan kestävästä kaupunkikehityksestä. Thank you, Markus. Ole Thank hyvä. you. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. Hello. Um, in terms of sustainable urban development, we have an excellent setting here uh, in the built environment sector. We have a uh, president of Finnish Association of Architects and a chief expert uh, in the city of Helsinki, Ms. Henna Helander. Um, we have a development director at Asuntosatia, a non-profit uh, Finnish housing trust, Ms. Katarina Haik. Good morning. Uh, we have a university lecture, lecturer in sustainable uh, urban development um, in Tampere un University uh, with strong ties to London, um, University College of London and Vancouver, Mr. Jonathan Taylor. Good morning. And we have a district, district manager in Skanska Residential Development um, in Tampere and Jyväskylä, uh, Mr. Tony Tuomola. Morning. Yes, welcome all, uh, and it's so nice that you, you could came, uh, come here. Um, Katarina, uh, Asuntosatio uh, is developing an ambitious mixed-use service block concept, Jätkän Messi in Jätkäsaari. Um, what are the sustainable urban development implications of this project? This project uh, will be built for um, various seg segments of uh, uh, customers uh, by various developers. So we are, we've brought together or, or our team uh, contains of several developers and some businesses and some organizations. So this is what we like 
doing nowadays is having several stakeholders in one project and bring our knowledge together and have open discussion. Thank you. Uh, Henna, uh, Safa has published a position paper about um, quality of housing construction. What was the reason for this? Oh, there are so <laughs> many reasons. <laughs> Uh, the purpose of housing is to create framework for good life. And now our flats are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, they are more corridor-like. They are difficult to furnish. Mm, habitability has declined. And also we are... We are um, we are doing this in a in, um, structural system which is uh, very uh, unflexible. So I think we need like new ideas now. Thank you. Um, and I think that was uh, really to the topic, the, the paper that you made. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, um, how do you see British cities from the sustainability perspective and if you can compare them somewhat to Finnish cities? Yeah, I've only really been working in the Finnish context for about six months now, so I have the caveat of not fully understanding what I'm talking about just <laughs> yet, but I'm learning. But um, sustainability issues in the UK, I think the primary one, or one of the biggest one is uh, it's got a really old housing stock and it's really energy ine inefficient perhaps the most energy inefficient in, in uh, Western Europe right now. So they're going to go through a big progress where they're making houses more energy efficient, but as I think Finns discovered over the, over the past 50 years, if you don't do that correctly, it can lead to a number of different health issues. So there's understanding that trade-off between health and sustainability. I think on average, the Finns are more aware of sustainability issues. Maybe they have more time, a better quality of life, so they're able to uh, think about these issues and the behaviors a little bit more. Um, having said that, coming here, one thing that surprised me was that Finns often have an engineered solution for something that in Canada or the UK would be, there'd be a more natural solution. That's a good point. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, Tony, uh, Skanska is building Hermalaranta neighborhood with a new kind of uh, block-like structure uh, with, with shared utilities common rooms, saunas, workshops, also said cars. Yes. Uh, what are the lessons learned from, from this project? It's partly yes. finished already, but yes. still going on. Herman, that is a, quite a big project also for us and area for 5,000 inhabitants. So uh, the development phase was very big task for us also. As, as we know that uh, city development is involved lots of people, lots of stakeholders. So in the very beginning, we also take all the stakeholders in the same table. So the interaction with the all, all stakeholders was the biggest issue. And of course, we had this sustainability agenda uh, as a driving force for the very beginning. But when bringing all the stakeholders in the same table, we were able to go forward and um, make kind of a big master plan for the area. And, uh, at, and in my opinion, we have succeeded that quite well. So project has going forward and now almost 70% uh, is now finished in the area. Okay, yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, these were the kind of warm-up questions and now we go <laughs> to the first round of panel discussion. Uh, urban, as we all know, urbanization is a global megatrend uh, and the future challenges or contemporary challenges such as climate, climate change um, Will be ha has to be solved in in cities also because like um, two thirds of uh, the world population is projected to live in cities by 2050. However, the actions are needed now. Um, so, what do you think? What are the most important challenges today in sustainable urban development? Just a small question <laughs> to the be beginning to warm you up. <coughs> um, anyone? Yes, please. I think um, when I think about where to build, that's the key question. Uh, where do we want to place people? Where do we want to place um, 
people's everyday actions and how do people connect themselves from one spot to another in their everyday life. Um, th that's the key question, location, uh, where's to be, where's preferable to have us people. Um, everything kind of um, gets encircled around that issue. And if we choose right, uh, then we've got a sustainable kind of foundation for a good society also. Yes, thanks. And vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's the possibilities to mm. good and bad here. Yes. Tony. Yes, the location is very important when we uh, think about uh, living. And when we have found the location, then the issue is how to reduce CO2 emissions in construction. That's, in from my point of view, very important at the moment because we have now the targets, roadmaps uh, in place, but we don't still have yet tools what to do to reduce CO2 emissions, in, in f especially in construction business. And that's the biggest uh, problem to tackle at the moment. Yeah, thanks. Good point. I, I think we are very okay. at critical points. Uh, for ex <coughs> The whole world is really changing our understanding. The concept of uh, time and space are changing. We are going to this post-functionalistic time. So uh, work and leisure time and family time and everything is like melt into each other's and how the structure of housing and our cities um, is adapted to that and I think now we are not making the best of it and um, it this comes to the old buildings and it comes to the uh, new buildings and it comes also to the whole city structure how to solve this I think this is like great opportunity to make, for example, of uh, suburban areas to be more like uh, part of the city, uh, very many-sided um, areas, but we can also lose it now, just building uh, small flats <laughs> without this um, flexibility idea of it. Yeah, yeah. Some city planners said to me that um, it's rather difficult to kind of design a new area now when the kind of work is changing, mm. housing is changing, the retail is changing. Yeah, commercial things, yeah. And kind of digitalization mm. is affecting to everything. Also yeah. like the transport is changing. So yes. what, what should we exactly. do now in, in this situation? Jonathan, please. Yeah, I, I would just say that, so you mentioned the global context and urbanization around the world. I would say that the challenges are really different in different parts of the world. And so in the developing world, in the global south, uh, it's a completely different set of challenges and, and very significant challenges. But sort of within this first world or the Finnish context, for me, one of the biggest challenges is kind of, as you alluded to, the uncertainty. So we know that the climate is changing. We don't yet know. I mean, there's uncertainty in the climate models, but there's also uncertainty in terms of what emissions pathway we're going to proceed along from the future. There's uncertainty in terms of, you know, we can research certain parts of the built environment really, really well, but we don't necessarily know what the unintended consequences of changes that we might make are, and how the complexity of cities and the interrelations between the social, then the economic and the built environment all interrelate. And so we need more information about that. And, and, and then there's uncertainty with the so-called black swan events like coronavirus, you know, how long is it going to last? Is it going to change the way that we have lived in the past? Um, and what unforeseen events in the future might come along? Yes, yes. I think you are all raised really important points. And there are like multiple dim dimensions of the like sustainable urban development. Maybe we could first discuss about the, like what would, would be a city like if we would take the climate change seriously, what 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 would be the uh, Tony mentioned that we um, we don't have like like the proper tools to reduce the CO, CO2 emissions at the moment. But if you 
would have like the right to decide by yourself that hey let's do it this way what would be the the most important changes um, in a city structure but also um, maybe like you Hannah said that it's like uh, um, like doing the like the new houses but also like renovation of the old areas and and at the same time thinking about the city structure you could kind of uh, discuss on all of these levels but what would be the most important changes um, climate wise um, in urban development this particular moment yes please uh, i would stop pulling down uh, houses <laughs> first. Um, I would um, reuse all the structures, special concrete structures, um, and all the new houses I would uh, made of wood or uh, in very wise way uh, of concrete so that uh, the material to be used is minimized. Uh, then I would do that kind of structures that uh, are very flexible, like uh, basically a column slab structures. Um, then um, mm, I would fix only the things which are broken, like uh, basically in, in that way. Um, I would also um, take care that people, places are diverse so that uh, people can really uh, live a good life there, that they take also care of the environment. All things are very low tech, uh, not like uh, you said that uh, in Finland we are always uh, solving problems in very engineer like um yeah this kind of things yeah quite many yeah uh, propositions <laughs> so you can yes, maybe uh, do, do those <laughs> yes uh, uh, at least uh, some uh, mainly the, i would uh, also concentrate the diversity of the areas so uh, in, in good cities living areas working areas we should have all uh, uh, facilities available meaning that so you, you don't have to transport move to, too much for example working places daycare groceries housing all in the same area so you can live your life in the same area uh, without moving uh, many kilometers away and now because this digitalization and uh, changes in working is moving very fast this year so that's a good opportunity now to really change the, the, the diversity of the areas and put the old working places, living daycares, schools in the same area in yeah. a wise way. Yes, like uh, mixed use development areas. Yes. Um, and like if you think about the history of um, Finnish constru construction and maybe suburban um, idea, it was more like an area like functional separation, the yeah. area for housing, area for work area for industry but now we are like making the cities again uh, in a way that it's kind of uh, you can live there you can work there you can um, uh, like uh, like our it. grandparents yes yes yes, yes. yes. Yeah. like of small with it yeah. yes 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 really slight idea yeah. yes yeah please Katarina. yeah um i would, I would um, be keen on seeing moving in small steps but in kind of large variety of uh, issues and sciences and actions. Um, in history, we've um, learned, all of us, about um, uh, different utopias, how to build an ideal society or ideal city structure, um, how do functions locate, um, and so on. Um, I think that's not possible. We've got a huge building environment to take care of. And as um, Henna mentioned, uh, it's important to take care of what we got already and, and do a uh, quality um, uh, build environment uh, when we build new, new build. Um, 
but it's a, it's a major issue how to deal with um, what we already have. And I think um, if we want to do everything, then we'd probably ask people, what, what is that you could do? Do you have an idea? And, and accept also that small steps can be good enough. We have a tendency in this society um, in Finland to uh, just um, look into one direction at a time and believe in one kind of maybe engineered um, mm. or uh, other sciences have produced some sort of solution. Uh, but I think we should uh, be ready to be more flexible in our thinking and more, accept more accepting in different solutions. Uh, the building inspection, for example, might not be the only um, uh, source of knowledge and, and so on. Uh, we, we must um, think much wider than what we do at the moment and not look into this chart that if you fill in this level, uh, that digit, then you're good enough. But actually, start thinking of my everyday, what can I do today, what can I do in a week's time, what can I do next year, what's ahead in 20 years' time. So like collaborative planning and also in that way you could um, uh, make different kind of areas to different places, not just, it seems to be that at the time we, contemporary times we do in Finland, we do same kind of areas in a way. Yes. Um, and not doing, like the variation is, um, there are some, some like positive uh, examples of doing it, it kind of other way, like Hermann, I think, mm -hmm. but, but like most of the development is same kind at this time. Yeah. A diversity to, to the development. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, <clears throat> so the question was framed in terms of what I would do. So yes. I'm going to take a more dictatorial uh, approach. Yes, and not <laughs> do small changes. <laughs> <but> saying, <laughs> because I, I do think that we need sort of radical transformative change. Yes. We don't have that much time to reduce emissions, to try and keep global warming within a certain threshold. So I think we need to try and you know, act cleverly and pragmatically, but, but try and get there you know, relatively quickly. And I think as Henna said, so, uh, renovating the old building stock is a really important thing. They say that the most energy efficient building is one that's already built. So if you're able to sensibly and cleverly renovate the, the existing stock so that it meets current purposes, that's, you know, that's a great way to do that. Um, in terms of, you know, renovating the buildings that already exist and the buildings that we're building now for the future, these buildings are going to exist hopefully in, in 50 and 60 years. And the climate's going to be quite a bit different in that time, whether we want it to be or not, regardless of what we do. So in terms of making housing energy efficient, it's not just cold anymore. It's going to be making it efficient for warmer summers, hotter weather in the future. And that's not going to be, you know, the solution isn't to install air conditioning units because they use up energy. You have to have these passive exactly. measures and climate proof your buildings for the future. So I think that's really important. The other thing is that we need sort of collective behavioral change. And I think we're all quite aware, but we don't necessarily realize how much mm. we need to change our behavior to be able to achieve these objectives. You think about the massive behavior changes that we had following coronavirus. I've heard the number 5% for the reduction in carbon dioxide emissions from, you know, globally due to coronavirus. Well, we need to be doing 7% and we need to be doing that every year. So that gives you an idea of how much change is necessary, and we need to figure out how to make that change happen, whether it's you know, collectively individual behaviors, but also at the political level. How do we make it happen? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of... Um, uh, the change is needed in kind of every sector you, uh, of yeah, life, in a way. Yeah, small changes, incremental yeah. changes, but you know, holistic, whole, and driven towards you know, the single goal, towards making a more sustainable and equitable and healthy future for the cities. Yeah. Mm. For example, we could, uh, we have to also change our behavior as uh, um, inhabitants. Uh, for example, um, uh, uh, reducing the temperature, um, room temperature by two degrees, we could like uh, save, uh, I don't know, 5% of something. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a great... I mean, sorry to interrupt, but like I grew and up... And we are not doing it. Yeah, I can't I understand why. Really 
cheap parents yes. who would sort of watch the, thermo the thermometer <laughs> and the thermostat <laughs> and just tell you to put on a sweater if it got too cold. And I think mm. there's, you know, there's scope to doing that. We can live, you know, with a bit colder temperatures, not so, you know, refined uh, indoor environment, and we won't suffer too much to be able to do that. But there's big, big savings to be had. Mm. Yes. yes. Mm. So uh, did I get you right, Jonathan, that you were like, uh, uh, for kind of renovation, the old building stock, stock but also like um, to make low-tech solutions, as Henna said uh, before? I, I don't, you know, I, I think there's probably really good reasons for why there are have been technical solutions in Finland, and I know the history with indoor mold issues and indoor air quality issues. Um, in comparable countries with comparable climates, you see natural solutions in terms of ventilation a lot more often, and I wonder how much energy you would save or whether there is, in fact, a true energy saving for, for moving toward in that direction. Um, but yeah, I would, I would, you know, in, in favor of you know, not so tightly a controlled indoor environment, giving people a bit more flexibility to reduce the temperatures and change their own behavior to uh, to reduce energy consumption. The most um, effic efficient, um, energy efficient uh, houses in Finland are built in 19th uh, century. So uh, they are over 100 years old. So, uh, like um, they have this um, energia todistus, what is that? Um, Energy certificate. Yes, uh, those tell that uh, those buildings are not uh, efficient, but uh, in real life they are very, very <laughs> efficient. Yeah. The most like uh, Helen has done uh, this kind of survey in their own yeah. building but stock. They are not energy efficient uh, in paper, but they yes. are energy efficient in practice. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Because of the like... They low tech. Yeah, low tech, yeah. thick uh, brick thick walls. walls, yeah. And maybe rather deep uh, structure in, mm. in a uh, mm. house. Also, and high rooms. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I think we have covered quite many topics here already. Mm. One, one thing... Um, that has kind of in in research literature, urban uh, research literature, literature um, is topical at the moment is the like the inclusion matter, and like for example in United States at the moment because of Corona, uh, there's like 30 percent of the population they they are struggling to get uh, to 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 pay their kind of housing expenses at the moment. Um, how do you see this situation in Finland? Is, is, it, is it bad, as bad, or a little bit better than in the States? Yeah. Oh, I, I think, so relatively, coming from, coming from the UK, which is similar to the States in that manner, um, there's a big inequity, um, larger so than in Finland. Finland's relatively very equal in that regard, and yes, housing yes, yes. is more affordable. I'm not saying that it's perfectly affordable across all income groups. And the standard of low income housing, I think, is generally a lot higher than it is in different parts of the, the parts of the world. So I think on, on the whole, Finland's doing, you know, uh, a remarkably good job in that manner. But but inequity around the world is increasing and it's increasing in Finland. And I think it's something that needs to be, you know, watched over mm. in the future. Yeah. I take one comment here, and then we get the chat question. Yes, Katarina, yeah. please. Yeah, I think it's <coughs> it's politically very important at the moment to understand uh, how much we need affordable housing for different segments of people. Also, not just not just one segment, but for a variety of segments. Um, it's something. Um, I mean, Asuntosatio owns over seventeen thousand um, um, units of housing all over Finland um, and uh, at the moment the situation uh, looks very decent. Um, people do, do manage to pay their, their fares, but um, it's definitely something uh, we need to look into how it goes. But uh, what, when it comes to making decisions, political decisions uh, of um, 
social housing and other affordable housing, then I think I would like to see political sharpness in this, especially now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, chat question. Is the conversation uh, will go on in a short while. Uh, kysymyksiä on tullut paljon ja niitä on tullut suomeksi ja myös englanniksi. Molemmat tavat ovat oikein hyviä. Tässä <coughs> hieman pistetään meikäläistä sitten koville toisella <laughs> tavalla. Uh, one uh, question in Finnish that uh, I'll try to translate uh, here too. Miksi sitten Suomessa ei rakenneta kestävämmin? Ajatellaanko liikaa hintaa nyt, ei hintaa koko elinkaaren aikana? Why is that in Finland? Uh, we don't build more sustainable way. Is it too much to price right now, not the price during the whole, uh, whole age of the building? Ja lisäksi Markukselle tuosta Twitter-mielipidettä. Twitter One okay. question or something uh, okay. in subject in Twitter too. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You have, yes. Hello. Yeah. I think it's just correct <laughs> idea behind the question that uh, uh, yes, we we are thinking in very short term uh, way, and um, we building industry is very old fashionable. So all structures we are making. They are. They come from 70s. In fact, we are we are building almost exactly in the same way than we built those buildings in in suburban areas in 60s and 70s. And um, of course, we have just more technology there and more facilities like bathrooms and so on. But uh, we. It's easier to build in the same way than before, and you you are also getting more money in that way. And people also um, buy those, and in investors buy those uh, flats because they know what they get. It's easy for everybody. Yes, uh, I give you Tony right away, but I yeah. just one comment in between that maybe we need to have kind of. New, new kind of like um, finance structures for construction to 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 be able to make those environmental environmental investments. Or oh, what is your opinion, Tony? <coughs> yes, that's true. That the investment is the driving force when making, for example, residential buildings. And uh, mainly this is because the the home, for example, it's a very big investment for everyday life. Car is more more cheaper and a mobile phone, but uh, there should be more uh, incentives. For, for example, financial issues, how to put uh, effort to the, the life cycle cost of, of housing. And that's a big issue also in Finland, because now we are kind of in a, in a changing mode at the moment, that the financial structure is changing in the whole world. So so there could be could be demand for new new kind of uh, financial structures which would uh, based on the economical or sustainable issues more and we could use the like the european union invest investment program for that because there was yeah, like uh, quite a lot of money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there uh, would you like to comment to this or I, well, from the UK perspective yeah. um i think land prices are so high that developers of new properties have a really difficult time achieving any kind of a profit. Uh, so they're reluctant to sink significant costs into research and development, constructing in sustainable ways. They just want to get a building up sort of <coughs> as cheaply and as quickly as possible. And also because of those land prices and the prices of um, you know new properties, they don't tend to sell it to the average person. They're selling it to a certain category of people, and they tend to be investors. Mm. These people aren't going to actually live in the house, so they're choosing their house like they would choose a car, something shiny and cool looking and fast, but maybe not something that, you know, is actually a nice, healthy, happy place to live. Yeah. And like, if you think about like the state of the contemporary world ec economy, it's kind of a, in terms of housing, we are in a difficult position because um, as the central pr banks are printing money to the market, um, the money goes to the assets 
like stock prices, but also to the real estate. And that kind of rises the prices even more in, in hotspots like London and maybe in Helsinki, uh, in lesser extent in Tampere, but in all the places that are growing. Mm. Did you have some comments? Uh, yeah, maybe a few words uh, just to oppose a little bit what Hen Henna mentioned about the um, construction industry being where it was in 60s and 70s. Um, I don't think so, having worked in, in there for a decade previously. Um, I think construction seems to me um, that is much more technical uh, than before. When you look into the product nowadays, um, um, clock of flats, <coughs> it's got a lot of different technologies. It's got uh, um, a ventilation systems, it's, it's got all sorts of electrical systems and so on and so on. Compared to a 60s, 70s uh, block, it's very simple. You just open the window, you get the air in, and you open the window on the other side of the building and, and it draws through. We're not there anymore, but we've got pretty complex buildings um, also to maintain. And I, I also look into that point of view, what is it what it is to maintain buildings. And uh, of obviously it's much more expensive to maintain these buildings because they need uh, more attention and they need more special uh, specialists to take care of them. So we're talking about completely different product um, if we compare si 70s housing into 2020s and 2030s, if we talk about future. So this is also what builds up um, costs for us mm. as inhabitants. So would you go to more low-tech, <laughs> like Henna said before? Uh, possibly, uh, possibly. I think that's, that's one uh, thing that I wanted to say in the beginning, that we need to look wider, we need to maybe reduce some regulations and kind of open up ourselves to new possibilities. Now we're very um, restricted um, to what we can do and what we can't do. Building inspections, there's, this is right, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> if I kind of yeah. <laughs> say it black and white. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, we, are, we totally agree. I mean, uh, what I meant uh, we built in 70s way, I meant that um, we are still having uh, load-bearing walls between every flat and uh, on the Lolata, which is a concrete slab, uh, which has been invented 1971, is like the thing we are still having in our, all our construction sites. And uh, that uh, structure system, uh, according to Karin Krugfors, um, Mikä uh, väitöskirja? Doctoral dissertation. Uh, doctor, yeah. Uh, is the most unflexible uh, structure system in the world. And you also pour a lot of concrete in it. And you can't make flats bigger and change the f uh, flats and typo uh, typography of the flats. And you also use a lot of material concrete material yeah but uh, that there comes also the tradition i think local traditions in finland uh, maybe it's a i don't know if it's a hollow slab or something though yeah, hollow hollow slab. Perhaps. okay uh, but um, um some other like some construction companies are y using that but some has a different kind of history uh, like skanska in, in Tampere, they are using the how they call it um yeah, in situ slabs the is, concrete yes yes yeah. so it's like a bike bike la valetto in yes. finnish um locally um, that percent of that slab is very low in finland it's it like some pro percents yeah. not yeah. like but uh that's true that the finnish construction system is based on the 70s uh in the big picture but uh this maybe the reason why we are still doing it in the same method is that the Finnish market is very small. Mm. We are only five million people, so it's and our, our legislation is very uh, different than from Europe or worldwide in general. So it's quite difficult in, in Finland to change our way of working rapidly. 
because That's true. because market is so small, yeah. we can bring from uh, things from Germany to Finland because we have lots of legal li restrictions in th this case. So that's a little bit. Uh, it not, it's a quite big problem, in fact, in Finland that we cannot bring good ideas from abroad to Finland. So uh, there was like, uh, for example, in Arabia Ranta plan, there was this idea in Helsinki that. Uh, Okay, this is the kind of basic level that you should do, but if you bring a better solution, you can do it. So maybe we should have that kind of thing also in um, in Finnish le le legislation and uh, building permits yes. that you could kind of, this is the basic, but you could make better or alternative solutions there. Maybe that, that would kind of uh, change the scene a little bit. I think Doesn't we are running out of time, so we should yeah. uh, say that you you can have certain amount of uh, concrete in in one block of flat uh, or something like that. We we need radical changes now. Yes, yes. Uh, there's one uh, comment from Twitter that um, says that um, sustainable renovation of all buildings. Um, is is good, like we have discussed here, um, uh, and the, there was a point that involving citizens to take care of the environment and maybe their communities would be like more involvement of citizens would be good, um, and wooden construction of new new houses would be also um, uh, the Twitter says that it would be uh, a good good thing. Okay, yes, so. Um, we have kind of moved ourselves slightly already to the kind of next um, theme of our panel discussion, um, which is the, like the latest sustainability changes in urban planning and construction practice. So are there like, uh, at the moment, are there like um, things that are happening that are, um, that are, the, that are important ones that, and already practice in Finland. Um, could you name some of those? We have discussed a little bit some of those already, but yes, Katarina. Uh, we, can, we can see uh, much more demand within good public transport connections in, in our production and existing housing. Okay. And that's yeah. very positive. Yes. Uh, yes. People actually naturally want to go where train goes and metro goes and tram goes. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why, for example, why Suurpelto in Espoo has been kind of, mm. they have they have been struggling to, to make it mm. ready because there's no mm. good uh, rail connection mm. there. But even Suurpelto is uh, coming up now because there is a metro station nearby and another one not that much further away and okay. there is a bus connection yeah. to those. Yeah. So that's what it requires then when the whole um, city structure gets more dense in, in I'm talking about capital region now, yes. um, it does create more demand in the kind of in-between areas also, which Suurpelto is an example of. Yes, yes. And Correct. one concrete issue is the shared card uh, uh, mm -hmm. possibilities. Uh, last five years of time, uh, some uh, operators have come to Finland and now we have possibilities to serve people, uh, shared car pools and etc. And this is a very new thing still for our people, but uh, it's coming and it's a very efficient way to move and uh, uh, combine to tra public transportation and for, for example for biking. And that that's the latest, the big yeah. issue of that, in my opinion, is a very good thing. Yes, and if you think about like the uh, the the money you put into the car and money you put to the parking spot or place yeah. of the car, so it's it's a rather big sum if you are not using it, yes. like maybe daily two hours a day or something. So shared car is a really kind of clever solution for that. Yes. I think. Yeah, so <coughs> that's something that I've seen more of here, and certainly where a housing company might have a car that they share. That's something that, for me, is bizarre but wonderful. I mean, I think <laughs> we grew up in Canada hating our neighbors and we don't want to share oh. anything <laughs> with them. But, but the fact that you have that community spirit or the, the willingness to share and work together is really, <clears throat> is really nice. 
Um, I think another thing that I'm seeing more of in the future or going forward is, is sort of climate resilience and adaptation. So, for example, in London, if you want to do a big development you, as part of the planning um, application, you have to prove that you're, the building that you're proposing is going to be adapted to uh, the climate. Talk about what you're going to do to reduce indoor overheating risk and, and prevent uh, the need for, for air conditioning. So I think that's you know, a logical next step to start including that into building regulations and guidance and policy. Um, and one thing that I also like is the, the, the current movement that I'm seeing more of is the, towards well-being. So we can design a sustainable, energy-efficient building. We can make sure that the indoor environment you know, gets a certain amount of air changes per hour, and so it's, and it's right, perfect within a, a certain temperature band. But that doesn't mean that people are happy living inside it. If it's the size of a shoebox, if it's a 30-square-meter house, and you're stuck there you know, during corona working from home, it's probably quite an awful existence. So I think you know, we're becoming increasingly aware that homes are really important for mental health and well-being, and that that should be part of the, you know, the design of new buildings going forward into the future. Yes. All right. Uh, I, I think that, um, like said, cost, but also like said, utilities, maybe tools, yes. spaces, um, would be important in particular uh, this moment when, when we are building rather small apartments. So, um, so there be like more effort to um, build good said spaces like uh, rooms for visitors, saunas, laundry rooms, I don't know, cinema in the housing block. Uh, Tony, please. Yes, uh, I agree that because uh, people are, our households are even smaller and smaller. We have lots of single people every day more. So uh, in the future there will be also small homes. Uh, but uh, together with these small homes we need good facilities in the block or nearby. Uh, just you mentioned laundry, uh, recreational rooms, whatever. So we have to think the more holistic way this uh, block structure, city structure, that there's places where people can meet near nearby because homes might be smaller but uh, you have to have very close some places where to meet people in the real life, not only in the di digitally. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yes. Well, that's a nice uh, example. Um, I think um, there would be. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see the future so that uh, we would not be stated by the uh, municipality that how many square meters of uh, storage and, and club room we need per capita <laughs> in the housing company, but I would rather see uh, different developers like, like Skanska and all others to produce uh, different ideas that what could it be that people would actually like to have. We are, we are trying this um, service um, where we provide a kind of barrack with different tools and household um, gadgets for inhabit local inhabitants and um, they can go and rent these uh, gadgets per f for a monthly fee, which is very low. You can get a um, steam cleaner and, I don't know, uh, different electric gadgets for woodworks and so on in that little barrack, which is um, placed um, in a local square and all uh, other people rather than just our customers can come and use those services. This is one example. Like it might be uh, something different that the inhabitants want rather than uh, what the officials uh, kind of state that this is good for you. <laughs> yes, yes. So we, we should be more open for, for this sort of um, ideas. I think uh, because this concept of place and uh, time is changing so uh, strongly, we are living in real life and in virtual life, at the same time, and uh, our life is more like project kind of life. So uh, we need spaces which can be uh, for short time uh, uh, for voluntary group uh, um, doing something, and then uh, for the hobby group for something, and so on. And what is really uh, like worries me is um, because. Um, we are getting older and older, 
uh, how people can uh, walk and uh, have enough motion in their very small flats and what kind of environment uh, could like um, get people to walk enough so that uh, they can keep themselves and fit also in corona kind of epidemical uh, times and so on. Yes. Uh, my my wife just bought a kind of um, uh, smartwatch and there's a kind of a category um, like a, a recliner, recliner potato as a person <laughs> type and uh, how, how much uh, kind of uh, exercise that kind of person uh, would need. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems to be that in Corona times, uh, it's even harder to get the kind of the regular exercise mm. uh, when you get when you kind of move move around uh, by walking or by bicycle or even by some other means. Um, maybe uh, I think there's like some good developments going on. Like for example, the uh, the rail connections that are uh, in making in in. Um, capital region, but also the tram line that is in making in Tampere. Do you think that there would be, um, there's a need for more rail connections in other cities too, in Finland, or are they too small? There's like in Turku, they are planning to do that, but it's kind of, at the moment, it's in a, in a kind of process and they are not, they have been not uh, starting that yet, but. I, I think it's tricky. Um, I think there's internationally there's a push to Copenhagenize cities. So every, you, you imagine a clean, environmentally sustainable city, healthy, everybody would be riding bicycles everywhere. Mm. But when you've got a climate like Finland, it's really hard to do that when it's icy and snowy and minus 30 outside. You, you don't really want to do that. So, you know, if there's not an active transport option, if the city's not small enough or designed in a way that you can get around and get to work uh, walking um, at all, or cycling at different times of the year, then, then I think you do need these sort of, uh, um, sort of public transit options. Um, you know, buses are good, especially if you can get electrification of buses and you know, developing a new rail line takes a huge amount of resources to be able to do that. So, you know, there's a number of different options and you know, the best one might depend on on the city in the context. Yes, yes. But uh, I slightly disagree about the biking because like Oulu, Oulu is yeah. the, the leading biking capital um, in Finland and it's the, like uh, the weather conditions there are... But it's flat. It's is flat, it? yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. But like I bike through the year uh, in Tampere. Okay. Uh, but if like there would be like proper pi biking lanes like standing, I don't know, to kind of secure biking. Uh, Tampere could be the leading Nordic capital of biking if, if we would put effort to that, because there are yeah. rather good bike lanes already. Yeah. You can leverage here. that too by yeah. sort of having the snow plows go on the bike lanes before the roads and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Yes, yes. Hey, there's uh, another chat question coming yeah. in for us. So I give it straight to you. you can <laughs> okay, it's, it's rather long. This too. one's easier. This is uh, about Corona, the situation. Uh, what surprising effects Corona can have on homes and other buildings? Do we think and appreciate uh, them more when we actually have to be there more? Okay, yes. Surprising effects Corona can have on buildings and homes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, any comments? <laughs> I think I think, uh, I think all of us uh, who've had to w start working completely from home um, have been shocked by how flexible our homes are after all we and and how flexible us as in inhabitants have had to be um, we've managed to create some sort of um, desk system and some sort of intimacy to do the work some sort of uh, re-timing of our daily routines. And I think that's been the surprising factor um, when it comes to people's everyday housing. And we hear this from colleagues and, and some clients even. Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I think I think th you know houses weren't designed for that, and all of a sudden there's been this shock to the system where, you know, your house suddenly has to become your child's school. It becomes your office. It becomes where you maybe get some exercise during the day. It's it is um, it, you're having to use it for purposes it hasn't necessarily been designed for, but mm -hmm. it has been quite adaptable. I mean, for the most part, it's been okay and there's maybe improvements that we can make in the future and as we get more experience with 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 the idea of, of working from from home in sort of this coronavirus context but i think the surprising thing for me is how a lot of people have just figured out how to make it work hmm. Hmm. yeah yeah and i think that um if you think about the like the finnish um urban planning style um it has kind of proven to be quite good in a sense that um, I think like most of the Finnish cities, they have like the nature, the forest and the parks coming, coming as a fingers inside to the city and also the lakes or the sea. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're like um, uh, in Corona times, uh, there's an easy access to nature, which is really, it's better than just a balcony like in Italy, which is good too, of course, yes. but you have the balcony. Bal balcony. Yes, you, you have hand up some. Yeah, the old people have really suffered in their small flats mm. and uh, um, because sure. so, so this that they, uh, of course, the biggest thing is to be alone, but uh, the other big thing is this um, Miss of motion, <laughs> so that they can't uh, walk enough there. Mm. And uh, what I have also heard that uh, people are um, people need more uh, sound um, insulation <laughs> in the houses. Now we have uh, like common uh, kitchen living rooms. Uh, they are not very much working if they are like uh, four people uh, uh, having. Uh, this um, digital um, meeting at the same time and so on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure that there are quite a lot new needs with which we should take. And of course, lack of space mainly in big cities. Yes. And maybe like Corona is just one. We, I, I think mm. we will survive uh, of Corona. But I guess there will be new pandemias also. Mm. So maybe it's the or something thing. else. Uh, yeah, mm. something else will come. So we will, we need to figure out what kind of cities we need to plan. Mm. Tony. Yeah. Mm. Yes. I, uh, <coughs> because of this pan corona time, uh, I believe that the the need of the shared spaces will add in the near future. So we have to mm. think about the, not only the buildings but mm. the block structure yes. city yes. structure yes. where to work where to meet people so yes. this kind of in a positive way this this affects positively to our development mm. we have to think new way mm. of how this old way of <laughs> construction <laughs> business yes <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. create some pressure yes yes uh there's a um, rather long question um from from social media but it, like the the point here is that uh, uh, like, should we uh, prioritize market forces or regulation in in construction? Uh, and if you think this in a kind of sustainability context, context um, could there be like um, more more strong commercial incent incentive to build sustainability, a uh, sustainable in, in a sustainable way? Um, well, this is or a could it be created? <laughs> this is ni ni nicely put black and white. <laughs> 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 but I'm, I'm sorry to say I can't reply this very black and white. But let's. Um, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this um, market force regulation. What, what is behind this? I, I think behind this we have a slow market by its nature. Real estate is a very slow market, mm -hmm. and us as consumers are very conservative. And this is because usually when it comes to housing, we are making the biggest lifetime investments. Um, therefore, we are cautious. Therefore, we want to think twice and even more. That is this safe? Is this good? Is this lasting for me? Is it lasting for my children, perhaps? 
and so on. So we are conservative. The product is therefore difficult to develop. We can't compare it to car industry, for example, uh, where we are completely uh, kind of, well, more, more market related than regulation related, I guess, <laughs> without knowing it. But we are talking about uh, some sort of balance. And I think to, um, I think we need something else than just those two forces. I think we, uh, in order to develop proper sustainable solutions um, and a variety of them, we need some sort of a push from also political uh, decision makers. And I mean also financial um, um, help for those who are ready to pilot. Because uh, co the normal consumer is not kind of ready to take the risks. Uh, development companies are not uh, capable of taking m more risks than a little bit, uh, because you mentioned the mar as you said margins are are thin. So we need uh, to work on this together. It's not going to be a market or regulation solution, but it's going to be something uh, wider than that. We need to open ourselves um, to a, a kind of more willingness of changing uh, together. Yeah. This was a good Sorry about my uh, uh, non black and white ones. Uh, I just uh, <laughs> uh, say in between that this was, this was a good question because Sorry. Uh, the, like, um, the next uh, section for us would be uh, that the question is how to, what would be the concrete means to speed up uh, sustainable urban de development in, in near future. And one debate in that is this regulatory or market forces, but it, mm. as you said, it has uh, more nuances too. Mm. I think we have to first have aims, clear aims, and then we have to make new questions. And then we have to make new kind of regulations and new kind of uh, incentives. incentives, so that, um, and they, for example, in, in um, Dutch, Holland, uh, Holland that's, 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 yeah. That's, that's, yes. they have this kind of uh, uh, minimum space for, for house, which is like 15 square meters, uh, clear floor space. It's not like we have like a, a, our minimum flat is 20 square meters. Uh, that's, we, we just need to think in the new kind of way or we, we have uh, regulations for example um, uh, for this um, amount of concrete or, or something like this. So uh, not, not to uh, cultivate these old regulations or make them more strict, but just create very few and very powerful, and also taxes can like um, change. I think we need something <laughs> very shaky, but first we need to have aims. Yes, yes. Um, and sustainable urban development as such is rather broad aim. We have to kind mm. of um, make it um, more kind of practical. Exactly. To, to do it. Tony. Yes, the <coughs> aim and targets are very important. And uh, I'm very glad to see that, for example, the city of Tampere now launched the uh, CO2 roadmap. So now we know where we are aiming in, uh, in uh, development. And uh, the question about the uh, uh, regulations market wise, uh, I'm just in the same level that it's a combination of different kind of uh, methods. And, and when you make regulations, uh, I clearly recommend that there would, could, should be incentives for those uh, stakeholders who want to develop further. So there would be incentives from the authorities, uh, from the government level, that if you do better, you can get this. So that will put things forward. And, uh, but at the same time, I have to mention that there's many, many legislation restrictions what uh, binds uh, some sustainability issues, especially in the energy sector. You cannot do something because there's a, a 
electricity legislation restricting these new things. So in that point of view, we, sh we should, uh, we need to uh, reduce some legal re re restrictions in Finnish laws. Yeah, I think that, for example, uh, electricity metering at the moment is is bad in that sense that if you are producing electricity in your own uh, building or block um, and the metering goes this way, you have to pay taxes in between, yes. so it doesn't kind of uh, create any incentive. Yes. It's a kind of disincentive yes. in that sense. So, so, yes, yeah, I, I think I agree with everybody. I, you can't rely purely on market forces. We've been doing that for a few years around the world and it clearly hasn't worked at all in terms of improving sustainability. I think policy and regula well, I would say rather than regulations, policy and incentives and disincentives to be able to drive mm. construction companies towards building in a certain way are going to be really important going forward. I think there is an element for market force. I think like we're seeing with, um, the, with the growth in flight shaming that you're seeing, I, I, I think that people will start to see in the future if you've got a massive energy inefficient, you know, grotesquely oversized house, you're going to start to feel hopefully shame about that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think you can kind of, you know, hopefully collectively as society, the, the issues of sustainability come to the front. You know, y people are going to want to have these kinds of houses that are built in a certain sustainable way, but I might be overly optimistic. Mm. Um, yeah. What about this, like, uh, I, I talked a couple of weeks ago uh, with one developer and he said that um, devel developers hate pilot projects uh, mm. and there would be like, uh, because it's kind of, it takes more money and it's mm. uncertain if you can sell it. Um, and Qatar News said that the, there should be some kind of a, I don't know, maybe a, a fund or a person who, who is kind of willing to take the kind of extra step and kind of uh, make a, some kind of a pilot project that will be speed up the market mm. to, to the sustainable direction. Um, Tony, do you hate pilot projects? <laughs> uh, <laughs> depends on the size of the pilot. Yes. The pilot should be very uh, small and fast. Yeah. So in a way, the, the investment is rather small and you know fast what is the effect. Yes. So the, uh, I noticed the comment that if it is very big uh, pilot project for many years, so th in that case developers don't see uh, effort to be involved. But in nowadays you have to make small uh, tests rapidly and know go, does it go forward or not. Yes. But I think that in a way Hermann Randa is a rather big pilot project in a sense that they are like, uh, uh, how do you say, um, like a, like s smaller pilot projects inside yes. the whole development Yes, that's a big process. area, but it includes lots of small pilots in a long time period. So yes. that's yes. a kind of a, um, my, I think that's a very good way for a big construction and development company to go forward. Mm. Small steps in a long period, and we have a big kind of a kind of master plan what we want to do in the near future. So we go with small steps and take a big leap yes. afterwards. So that's that's another way to do it, uh, like uh, uh, in a kind of regular uh, construction business. Yeah. Uh, in a way, uh, it would be easier to do uh, relatively more piloting in government subsidized housing, uh, which sounds a little bit co con contradictory, but uh, that's the way it is because uh, actors like us, we can um, kind of, um, it's a kind of easier to take the risk of um, failing in parts of the piloting. Uh, we, c we shouldn't make loss because um, it's obviously not good, good for our uh, clients either. But we don't have the pressure of making any any um, any uh, wins. Also, because we're non non-profit organization, so I think uh, this is one concrete method um, of helping the industry develop to to uh, do that um, more, much more so in uh, subsidized housing than what we do at the moment. Yeah, and you could say that. Uh, if you think about Tapiola, mm. where Asuntosatia was really strong at the time, it's kind of a w 
it kind of um, created the way to finish suburban development, uh, but uh, and uh, Tapila is really nice, mm -hmm. but at the same time it was um, a little bit unfortunate because the the new developments were weren't as ambitious as Tapila. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, there's a um, um, question um, from the chat um, about Corona. If new social spaces are built within the blocks of flats, how can we make sure these spaces are pandemic proof? Uh, so if you say a sauna, a herbal space uh, and a laundromat or even more with the whole block of flats, how to make sure infection risks can be minimized when needed? Uh, I think that the question is same, same that uh, in, in working places at the moment. Sure. In, in offices we have rules how to keep the distance, clean the desks and uh, machines. And so same rules we have to bring to the, the housing areas as yes. well. Yes. I think you can, Henna's going to love this, have engineered solutions. I love engineers. <laughs> you know, we know that uh, it's become apparent that corona can spread through the air. Um, so you can have designed the room to have a slightly higher ventilation rate or good ventilation to try and reduce the risks of that. And then, yeah, of course, you know, like you would have for a communal sauna, maybe you sign up for a certain time to be able to use these spaces and, and so on and so forth. So there would be ways to be able to, to work around the corona. Yeah. Uh, I, I would <laughs> immediately <laughs> say that if we uh, is it recline on um, high tech, we need that uh, technical staff taking care of that. And we don't have it in the future in Finland. We don't have so many people to take care of uh, our technical uh, things and so on. We, we, are, we are lacking of those people and it also costs money. We can't, it's not like general uh, solution for everywhere. We have to go to low tech, I think. Yeah, generally, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think these fingers, uh, like forests as fingers uh, in the cities and lakes and uh, seas mm -hmm. uh, is one good thing here. Uh, if you think about pandemia. Uh, maybe another thing that um, it brought to the light is that um, maybe people need their own front, front doors, and that's possible also in a block of flats. Uh, and maybe uh, they own yards or bigger balconies for that mm -hmm. uh, um, reason that they, they kind of... Um, in the times of pandemia, they could uh, do their lives and do their business mm. to kind of um, in a safe way. Mm. And that, for example, in, in, in Helsinki, there's this um, Malta co-housing project. Uh, one idea there was to have like bigger balconies because mm. the kind of regular production doesn't provide those. That was before pandemia, of mm. course. And you, uh, uh, I think pandemia is one thing, but we will have uh, other kind of catastrophe <laughs> in the future and we don't know about them. And mm. therefore, I think uh, one item to talk is also uh, this glorification of greatness and uh, that we, we are like uh, thinking that having big organizations um, is always the better solution for everything. That uh, the more the better, and uh, I think uh, it's very vulnerable, vulner vulnerable, <laughs> vulnerable uh, thing. And uh, we we should also um, find other kinds of things, and uh, then it comes to the this urban um, structure. What we have there where um, are like uh, all the time less and less people and uh, we have this uh, money bike and in many multi uh, multiple places. Uh, places and so on how we can like take advantage of that kind of things and uh, um, what does it mean for urban and this sustainable thing yeah i think that in like in finnish context we have been like 
living the idea that bigger is better. Mm. <laughs> um, and that's, I don't know why, uh, because we are maybe because we are so few here. No. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. But uh, the other thing is that there is like, um, um, like you Tony said that like an urban village, a neighborhood, for example, uh, maybe local solutions, O also like local inventions that could be kind of if they are good they could be transferred to other places too mm -hmm. but there's not so so much room at the moment for local inventions and the like people doing together um, and inventing some new kind of uh, solution uh, at the moment or, or, or do you think that this right the the kind of Diagnosis. Yeah. We, we have a strong history and, and, and pr presence of regulations in the society, and I think this is one symptom that it's quite difficult to encourage people to produce something together uh, semi spontaneously. Yes. Uh, this, um, this almost makes me want to jump into the issue of <laughs> municipal land policies <laughs> because that, <laughs> could be, that could be one method of um, uh, helping. Um, innovations come out in sustainable um, housing, for example. Uh, we, we need concrete tools uh, to encourage developers and, and private people also to um, go for the piloting and, and just go for good uh, known solutions also. And I think the local land use policies is one, one very strong method when it comes to urban, urban futures. Yes, yes. Maybe also using the land use fees as incentives, uh, maybe lower them if you provide good solutions. Mm. For example, on uh, an, an urban refill projects, um, there are cities like Helsinki, which is kind of subsidizing or reducing a fee when you do an, a refill um, project. But that's one example, mm. yeah. but there should be 20 more. Yeah, Tampere is doing uh, in, in, in the field of urban infill the same, mm. uh, so it's kind of that's yeah. one one thing that has come out in last three years or so here yeah okay all right um so uh subsidies pilot projects leading by example perhaps and maybe cities could also um maybe um crafts or, or seeds the day, seeds seeds the day in a way that they they uh, could be more ambitious. Like uh, at the time, um, Espo has the most ambitious CO2 reduction program uh, because the target is 2029. Yeah. <laughs> Other cities, big cities, has have like 2030 or later. Oh. Yeah. But. Um, in the field of um, built environment, there could be some, of course, that's covering the built environment too, but there could be some targeted, ambitious uh, things there. What this could be, what do you think? What, what, what city could, can, can do in this? Uh, I, th I think this kind of measurements are always a little bit, um, we need them, but they are also very, dangerous thing because yes. we can measure wrong things and get mm. like wrong solutions uh, and now I think uh, for example quite often we don't um, count the CO this CO2 CO emissions yes exactly um, for for building things like for mm. new buildings and so on we just um, count uh, how how much uh, we spend energy when we are living in them, and uh, I think uh, it it makes us uh, this kertakäyttökulttuuri, um, which is uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah there, uh, there's kind <laughs> of a risk when you yeah. set those targets that it's it's about sort of marketing the city, trying to show that you're the best and. And you, there are creative ways of, ca of accounting for carbon emissions. You leave something out, you don't count something, so on and so forth. That, you know, is is what we call greenwashing. Basically, mm. you're, you're okay. trying to promote yourself as being green when actually, inside the black box of all the information that you're telling everybody, things aren't maybe quite as good as you're saying they are. So I think there's sort of 
there needs to be always open, transparent communication about like how those targets are being achieved. And you know, if they can get it by 2029, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, the sooner the better. But but you, I think you have to take them with you know a grain of salt, just you know for what they are really. Yes, but one, Hannah, you mentioned about this um, like CO2 emission counting for for like building materials but one thing could be to to design buildings for this assembly so you could use the maybe the walls maybe the um, um, like the roofs all the materials again um, um, if you build it in a such a way that you can kind of take them tear it apart and like um, use the materials again not to put them to the waste dump. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's a good idea, but I think better idea is yeah. to build, uh, for example, in the cities, to build, to be there for two, three hundred years. Yes. And not to rip down. And yes. so that the structure is basically so flexible that you can yes. Yes. Um, use it in very many ways. Purpose, and the yes. functions yes. can change. Yes, yes. So flexible structures and uh, like um, plan. Yeah, yeah, and also that you have good architecture. You have, uh, you also take a uh, well uh, that people are well in those places and feel welcome and so on. Yes, yes. Architecture. Architecture. That, that's it's one very, thing. <laughs> very important. <laughs> yes, yes. But yes. I, I think that, like in, um, uh, if you think about the Finnish history and we think about the old buildings in, in, um, um, for example, in Tölö in Helsinki mm. or in thirties, uh, in thirties, um, maybe a little bit old ones. Um, or fifties even. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and I, I think. That at the moment, um, in residential bu buildings or construction, the architecture has n not such a strong emphasis. Or am I wrong? Mm. I I think now um, we we are in 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 very big change. And I, I hope that we will see better residential houses uh, in every way, so that uh, the structures and architecture and uh, everything is better there. But I think mm. that, like, if you think about architect, just architecture, still um, in last five years or so, there there have been more architectural company uh, competitions. Uh, also in residential areas. Uh, in, in fact, Finland. in uh. Tampere, you have had very good uh, projects yes. here, I think. Yeah. 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 There are many competitive yeah. competitions. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that's one way to elevate the, yeah. Yeah. Like the quality yeah. of architecture. That's Absolutely. true. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But maybe mainstreaming it from Tampere <laughs> and <laughs> also like mainstreaming it from um, to to the more projects that are made in, in mm. Finland at the moment. It would could be, be better. Could be better. Yes. Could be even better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank thank you. Thanks for really interesting discussion. Good points. Um, now we have to kind of finalize the panel, I think. Tässä vaiheessa kiitän kaikkia keskusteluja. Thank you everybody. Hienoa keskustelua kestävästä kaupunkikehityksestä. Ja jos Markus tulisi vielä kanssani tänne itiin päin, meillä on ollut tässä keskustelun aikana jopa kaksi ja puoli tuhatta, lähes kaksi ja puoli tuhatta katsojaa, joten okay. en vitsi nyt kesken keskustelun, Joo. että hermostu, mutta että Joo, jo, oikein ei. hyvin meni tässä kohtaa. Joo, hauskaa. Kyllä, kestävä kaupunkikehitys oli tässä aiheena. Markus Laine oli studiomaestrona ja tuossa tuli aika paljon erilaisia näkökulmia ja nostit esimerkkejä mukaan esimerkiksi Helsingistä ja esimerkiksi Espoosta näitä mielenkiintoisia kohteita, mutta eikö me tällä hetkellä olla Suomen tai siis maailman kiinnostavimmassa kaupunkikehityskohteessa? Löytyy uutta areenaa, ratikkaa, rakennetaan erilaisia juttuja. Hiedanrannan mainitsit. Tampereella on hyvin paljon esimerkkejä, mitä seurata. 
Joo, kyllä mä sanoisin, että niin nyt, nyt menee todella kovaa <tampereella>, Tampereella. Ja tota, äh, ehkä, ehkä just tälleen, niin kun, jos mietitään kestävää kaupunkikehitystä, niin tota, kolme pointtia, mitä tässä keskustelussakin tuli esiin. Niin yksi on se, että, että tota, Tiivistäminen on aika niin kuin keskeisessä asemassa tässä nykyisessä kaupunkikehittämisessä. Tämä ratikkahanke, mikä Tampereella on, niin tulee tukemaan sitä. Se tarkoittaa myös sitä, että, että tämmöiset niin kuin monitoimintoiset alueet, niitä tulee enemmän. Esimerkiksi Edenrantaan ollaan tekemässä semmoista englanniksi mixed use alue, missä on niin kuin työpaik- työpaikkoja, asumista ja niin kuin vapaa-ajan toimintoja ja palveluja. Mikä on se ehkä se uusi... Niin kuin tavallaan kaupunkikehityksen muoto, mihin tähdätään. Mutta meidän pitäisi saada tähän niin kuin mukaan sitten ö, myös niin kuin tällaista niin kuin, ö, vihreitä, ö, ja, niin kuin, vihreitä ö, ja tota, sinistä ö, kestävää infraa, eli, eli joka koskee niin kuin, ö, kaupunki, niin kuin, kaupunkiympäristöä, eli puistoja ja tällaisia vaikka korttelien sisälle, ö, samoin tota, niin kuin vesiinfra ja sitten energiainfra, ö, joka tota, pitäisi niin nostaa ihan uudelle tasolle nyt tässä tulevassa kehityksessä, jos me jotain saavuttaa näitä tota, ilmastotavoitteita. Ja sitten tietysti pitäisi myös muistaa, että niin community building, eli niin yhteisöjen rakentaminen, että alueet pitäisi suunnata niin, että ihmiset pystyy tekemään siellä yhteistyötä ja se kannustaa siihen, tulee reittejä ja niin kuin, asioiden ympärille, joita ihmiset käyttää ja palveluja. Tuossa keskustelussa tuli koronakin totta kai arvatenkin esiin ja se kyllä todistaa sitä, että muutokset tapahtuvat hyvin nopeasti silloin, kun ihmisillä on yhteinen tahto. Eli sen etsimisessä ehkä sitä haastetta riittää enemmän kuin sitten loppujen lopuksi muutoksessa. Se on just näin ja tuota, musta tuntuu, että ehkä se koronaopetus on just se, että, että kyllä niitä muutoksia pystyy tekemään, että ei tarvitse tuota, jankata, että, että näin mennään. Vaan, tuota, mutta siis tämä, Koronassa on jotain uhka, joka toi sen mahdollistisen muutoksen, mutta ehkä me voitaisiin tehdä myös muutos positiivisen kautta. Me voitaisiin ajatella, että Suomessa ja Tampereella tehdään maailman parasta kestävää kaupunkia ja yritetään tähdätä siihen ja kertoa se muillekin. Johtaa tai osoittaa esimerkillä, että se on mahdollista. Siellä linjoilla on ollut paljon katsojia, se on aiheuttanut hieman sitä, että myös kommentointi ja keskustelu on ajoittain ehkä hieman ruuhkautunut. Meillä konehuoneessa tekniset henkilöt öljyävät näitä datakaapeleita parhaillaan. Tällä tasolla on minun henkilökohtainen tekninen tietämys, mutta joka tapauksessa. Kommentteja on tullut hyvin paljon, täälläkin sanotaan, että esimerkiksi Teslan kaltaisia juttuja tarvittaisiin tähän myös asumisen rakentamiseen. Ensin pitäisi muuttaa Suomessa meiningit ja sen jälkeen viedä tämä koko paletti ulkomaille. Onko hyvä juttu nopeasti? No varmaan siis mun mielestä hienosti panelistikki toi, toi tähän keskusteluun sen, että, että tota, joo Tesla ehkä, mutta sitten koska tämä asuminen ja kaupunki on niin, niin monitahoinen asia, niin pitäisi olla tällaisia niin pikkutesloja niin eri tavallaan niin kuin kaupunkisuunnittelun sektoreilla. Hyvä. Nyt siirrymme seuraavaan asiaan. Yksi tämän päivän odotetuimmista jutuista, professori Julian Birkinshawn keynote-puheenvuoro on luvassa seuraavaksi, joten sitä seuraamaan. Kiitoksia tästä, Markus Laine ja keskustelijat. Kiitos. Kiitos.